the 2022 M2 MacBook Air. I did the research, watched the reviews, and I got the base model 8-core CPU, 8-core GPU, with an upgrade to 16 gigabytes of memory and a 512 gig SSD for the full SSD speeds. In total, I spent $1,599 for my new MacBook Air. But then, two days later, Best Buy and some other retailers put this base model 14-inch MacBook Pro on sale for the same $1,599. So I got the eight core CPU, 14 core GPU, M1 Pro with the same 16 gigabytes of unified memory and 512 gig SSD. Now, one of these is actually a gift for my wife, Shh. but she doesn't need two MacBooks. Which one do I keep? And for the same price, which one is a better buy? Let's do some testing and comparison and find out. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ and I have a dilemma. I have two MacBooks, but at $1,600 each, I can only afford to keep one. So to determine which one I'm gonna keep, I'll compare the features of each laptop and I'll test the performance of both to see which one best fits my wife's use case. In the end, one of these MacBooks is getting a bow on it and the other is going back to the store from which it was purchased. And more importantly, hopefully you can learn from what I learned to help you determine which of these may be a better choice for you. Now, on paper, the MacBook Pro seems like the clear winner here. More ports, better display, better speakers, more powerful M1 Pro SoC, but the MacBook Air has some key advantages, namely at over five millimeters thinner, a pound lighter and 37 square centimeters smaller, it's definitely much more portable than the larger, heavier Pro. And because the Air now shares the same flat, sleek design as the Pro, it definitely feels better in your hand than the old wedge shape. I know this part is subjective, but it just feels more durable than the MacBook Pro, like it's more capable of just being tossed in a bag full of books or whatever and dragged around all day. There's also the fact that because it's passively cooled, there's no intake and exhaust fence like there are on the Pro, so it's more resistant to dirt, dust, and moisture, and you don't have to worry about choking it off with whatever surface you use it on. And passive means silent. Now, the MacBook Pro is pretty much silent most of the time in typical workloads, browsing office work, but during some more demanding workloads, the fans can get quite audible. Now, as you probably heard, the M2 MacBook Air thermal throttles, which is true, but it's not news. Every MacBook Air ever thermal throttles. The M1 Air throttles, the Intel Airs throttled, the M2 actually throttles less than those do. That's just the cost of being so thin, light, and silent. Also, it only really affects sustained multi-core workloads, which aren't what most people are doing on a MacBook Air. Now, with that said, the Pro is still very portable. In fact, they both fit inside my sleeve that was designed for a 13-inch MacBook Pro, and at under four pounds, the Pro still meets the definition of an ultra portable. As far as features, some of the things that don't separate them much are the keyboard and trackpad. The trackpads are identical, and aside from the black background on the Pro and maybe a half a millimeter less travel on the Air, Apple is very consistent with their Magic Keyboard and the typing experience is pretty much identical for both. Both have Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0, so no difference in wireless connectivity. The camera also isn't a big factor. Both MacBooks have a 1080p FaceTime camera with an integrated triple array microphone, but the MacBook Pro has more advanced digital image processing and voice isolation, but I'll let you judge the quality. But there are a few areas that do significantly separate the two. The first is expandability. You get the new MagSafe 3 charging on both, but while the Air only has two Thunderbolt 4 ports and a high impedance headphone jack, the Pro has three Thunderbolt 4 ports, the high impedance headphone jack, plus an HDMI output and an SD card reader. Now, for some users, the HDMI and SDXC card slot are a big deal. For others who don't really connect things to their MacBook anyway, not so much. 
especially considering something like this simple $50 USB-C hub gets you all the extras plus more. The next feature that separates the two is the speaker quality. While the Pro maintains the top mounted speakers, the Air moves the speakers to the back of the laptop, essentially replacing the exhaust ports in the Pro's design. Let's listen to the difference. Depending on how you're listening to that, you may or may not have heard the difference, but while the vocals and high ends were good on both, the mid range on the air is muddled and the lows are indistinguishable. Next of course is the display. I'm not going to go through all the stats. The Pro is of course about a half an inch bigger diagonally and has a slightly denser resolution with an extra 30 pixels per inch. But what I found interesting is that although both displays on paper have a max brightness of 500 nits for SDR, with brightness maxed, no dimming or true tone enabled, and no third party apps to increase the brightness, the Pro was significantly brighter just on the desktop. Now, of course, on HDR content, the Pro has a sustained brightness of 1000 nits, and that was very noticeable as the HDR content was much brighter and in combination with the much higher contrast ratio, much more defined. Tiny details are much more apparent on the Pro, but there is some significant light and color blooming on the Pro display. Here, there should be a very distinct line between white and black on the edge of the lizard's face, but the light and even the color from the lizard blooms into the back background up to a half or three quarters of an inch. But overall, the Pro's display is objectively better. Now, one big area where the MacBook Air has an advantage is battery life, with the smaller 52.6 watt hour battery lasting seven and a half hours longer than the Pro's 70 watt hour battery in the Underwriter Laboratory's battery life test. Both these results surprised me a little. The Air exceeded my expectations, while the Pro didn't quite meet them. Let's look at the performance of the two, and we'll start with the raw CPU performance. In a single Cinebench R23 run, the Pro has 11% better multi-core performance, but if we increase the Cinebench run to 10 minutes, we see the passively cooled MacBook Air score fall by 5.6%, while the actively cooled Pro score stays exactly the same. In a Blender multi-core workload, the Pro pulls ahead by 17%, and the Pro has a 12% better Geekbench 5 multi-core score. Switching to single core performance, the Air pulls 3% ahead in Cinebench and almost 9% better in Geekbench 5. In the Geekbench Metal Graphics test, the M1 Pro scores 46% higher than the M2, and in some other graphics benchmarks, it's a similar story. In Wildlife Extreme, the Pro is 62% better, and in a shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark, the Pro has a 63% better frame rate. While those workloads are synthetic and 3D rendering or AAA gaming are not necessarily representative of the types of workloads most MacBook users are doing, the scores do highlight the strengths and weaknesses of each of these laptops. While the larger, more powerful M1 Pro with its double the memory bandwidth is better suited for longer multi-core or graphic intense workloads, the faster, more efficient M2 is better at single threaded bursty workloads that aren't heavily dependent on memory bandwidth. So let's take a look at how this applies to real world workloads. And in my last video, one of the big things that separated the MacBook Air from the Intel and Ryzen competition was video editing performance. And if we look at performance in Adobe Premiere Pro, the results are right in line with what we could expect with the MacBook Pro scoring 77% better than the MacBook Air in the Puget Bench test which takes into account both timeline performance as well as render times. Switching to DaVinci Resolve, I put together three real world projects. Test video one consisted of over 30 4K clips I took directly from my cell phone and cut into a 1080p timeline with no grading or effects, just a handful of simple transitions. Video two is the same 10 minute video, but this time on a 4K timeline with some moderate grading, audio work, several more complex transitions, several text overlays, and a second audio backing track. The third video is one of my actual 10 minute channel video projects and consists of 6K Blackmagic RAW, ProRes 422, 8-bit H.264 and H.265 clips with a lot of grading effects, audio work, text and animations. 
Here, the MacBook Pro was able to render all three projects 93% faster than the Air. And of course, although the timeline response on the Air was good, it did start to slow down once you applied color grades and effects, while the Pro was able to scrub and play through the fully edited timeline, barely dropping frames. Let's look at some of those single core bursty workloads, starting with productivity. Testing a number of tasks in Microsoft Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, and here the MacBook Air takes a 5% lead. In the Speedometer 2.0 Safari browsing test, there also has about a 4% advantage, and in a Firefox nightly build, both laptops are impressive, with the Air building the browser about 8% faster. Finally, testing several tasks in Photoshop and Lightroom, the two are pretty even in photo editing, with the Air pulling ahead by just 2%. After all that, unless you plan on doing some serious video editing where the MacBook Pro has the clear advantage, in most other day-to-day -day computing tasks, browsing, home or business office work, light coding, video editing, those single digit percentage differences between the two, you're never gonna notice. So realistically, the performance may not be a helpful or deciding factor for a lot of people. Ultimately, as far as design features and performance, the vast majority of MacBook Air users are gonna pick the Air, and MacBook Pro users are gonna pick the Pro because it's what fits their already established use cases, and this generation of each is better than the last. The deciding factor for me also comes down to use case. Switching from a Mac Mini to a MacBook is more so my wife can be untethered from her desk and be more mobile within the house. She doesn't have the need to bring her laptop to and from work, so the extra portability of the MacBook Air isn't that important, and because it will spend most of its time docked to a desk setup, the native expandability is key. Being able to connect directly to two external displays, external storage, and still have an open Thunderbolt port simplifies things and eliminates the need for a possibly expensive dock. So as you guessed, I'm going with the MacBook Pro. Secondarily, the speakers on the Pro are better than the soundbar she currently uses, and the FaceTime camera and microphone with the voice isolation and noise reduction is better than her current webcam, so those are two peripherals I can eliminate. But I don't wanna to give too much away because I will be completely redoing my wife's desk setup in an upcoming video, so be sure to get subscribed for that. Can I break her from her dual monitor dependency? Anyway, more selfishly, I went with the MacBook Pro because if I ever decide to 10 things like CES or Computex or such, I can take it along and have close to the same editing capabilities as I do here on my Mac Studio. So really it comes down to both our use cases. But that's where I'd spend or did spend my $1,600 and ultimately why I think this is the best value MacBook there is right now. But which would you pick and why? Or do you think that kind of cash is better spent elsewhere? Let us know in the comments and while you're down there be sure to click that like and maybe consider subscribing and i hope to catch you in the next one